playing last night. I have lost. Um, I, I I was talking about Jim as a as a friend uh, and said last night I wouldn't talk about his um, architecture, um, but I, I will say a little bit about his architecture because I think it, it comes out of his character. Um, I did know him a long time ago. Um, over 40 years ago, and he became very monosyllabic later, but in those days he did talk a lot, and we did talk a lot together. And um, I think that there is a parallel, and if you like, or it's stupid to talk about that kind of secret of his architecture, but I think it was that he had an enormously rich character, and he didn't hold any of it back, as maybe a lot of us would, he allowed it all into the architecture, which is what gave it its extraordinary ability to reconcile and bring together contradictions. Um, he, he'd been a paratrooper and involved in very violent hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and there was an element of violence in him. I recall at least one occasion in a restaurant when his fist was placed within two inches of the chin of somebody who was annoying us. And it was a weapon that didn't need to be used, I may say. Um, there was a tremendous tenderness and gentleness in him. And I was talking last night about the time when he put a little nestling back in its nest, climbing up a ladder. Um, there was an outrageous sense of humor, and there was a tremendous physicality. Uh, the idea of a body image, which is one of the things Plasma was referring to just now, was something which he would often express um, in, a, in an image that was fairly sort of unprintable. Um, but we went straight to the point and gave one a feeling of a sort of ghostly humanist analogy hovering behind these sort of images of his. Um, I'm not going to read all this. I'm just going to pick a couple of points. One is that he was of the generation... Um, my generation, whose problem was that, and this is what Izazaki, I think, touched on too, is that the modernist invention, in its first appearance, at the time when we were born, was totally <coughs> realized already. And you could take an image like the Pavillon de l'Esprit Nouveau, where there was a new language, the first new language of architecture since Saint-Denis and Gothic, a fully worked out canon. And then you would, you would take uh, Daraka's sanatorium, in which there was an architecture which said that it was answerable to its society, talked about um, hygiene, economy of energy, um, and said that art wasn't anything to do with it. Um, and somehow <coughs> or other, the problem of, of how you could pick up the, the baton of, of that was something that Jim had to confront. And what he was always trying to do was to extend, was to deepen the game. He got extremely bored when the diagrams began to condense into easily repeatable things. And the way he went about it was this. Uh, Schiller refers, uh, there's, a, there's a statement about Schiller about play, 
in which he says, man is only man when he is playing. And that's a very dark saying because it could be an invitation just to fool around, which is the way people like Philip Johnson and Peter Eisenman have construed it. But, but it is, in fact, a deep, deep cultural responsibility. And what it really means is that it is only when you have got sufficient grasp of all of the contradictory elements, and it was a sort of phrase that uh, Alto would use to um, could you then rise above the contingency of just being determined by them and transcend them through play, through magic play, um, into something which actually embodied a way of life and gave it a vividness, a recognizability, a memorableness um, that Jim was one of the few could do, and that was the kind of chemistry of it. Um, he, I mean, he sort of started off as a student of Colin Rowe um, with, with an enormous sort of erudition. Um, and Eliot said of somebody that erudition was part of his imagination. And it was with Jim. And if you've got enormous erudition and a fantastic natural talent, and you've also got the guts to bring all this stuff together and not try to tidy any of it out of the way, you get something quite remarkable. And I only want to touch on one thing, which is um, about Stuttgart. Find it. I remember that Colin Rowe wasn't entirely happy about that. Um, this is the one bit I'm going to try and read. He was lamenting the uh, absence of a facade, <coughs> because Colin loved standing in front of buildings and going through, you know, all this <laughs> stuff. Um, a, B, B, A, B, and Zuckeri, and so on. Now, I myself applaud Sterling's response. He, he said that the ambivalence of the front corresponds to the ambiguity of the boulevard. So the Konrad Adenauer Strasse is more an autobahn than a street. And instead of a facade, the front recedes presenting a series of incidents adjacent to the walking movement in and through and across their building. <coughs> End of quote. It's only too easy to imagine in the world that Ken summarized just now, the sort of hectoring one-liner with which a postmodernist would have tried to address the passing traffic like a Hitler march past. And it's not easy, on the other hand, to imagine what would be the relevance of a sort of ruminative Colin Rowe play on symmetries and mannerisms and so on. And Jim's final comment was another dark <laughs> saying. He said, the casually monumental is diminished by the deliberately informal. I like that. And <clears throat> this is a long way <clears throat> from the way he used to talk about his buildings, which were strictly in functionalist terms, much to the amazement of people who were expecting more mysterious statements than that. But I think that that last statement of, of his was a little bit of a giveaway of what he meant in, in another sort of throwaway line, which he said, any building has to have at least two contradictory ideas. And uh, he, in the case of Leicester, he said, the way there were two geometries gave you a kind of repertoire, a, a much richer repertoire than, than one. 
And for, for, for me, um, at the end of the day, it, it, it was this sort of extra thoughtful rejection of the horrible false rhetoric that we're encouraged to use now that was part of the, of the, the genuineness <coughs> of Jim's achievement. Um, the, the last time we ever spoke together, um, he brought up the subject of um, Alvarado, uh, <coughs> for whom he and I shared a passion. And I think just one, one of the things that is odd, we've looked at the whole range of his sort of heroes in a way. And of course, Asplund was another, and Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, one of Jim's major taking off points was the Johnson Wax building. And I've always found it very, very puzzling that in the United States, someone like Philip Johnson would say, Frank Lloyd Wright was the greatest architect of the 19th century, so I'd dismiss him. Somehow or other, Alto has never been given his due. He's been written off as an expressionist. Um, people can write books about the rebirth of classical architecture in America without any reference to Asplund and Leverance who were the only architects of the 20th century who brought any magic to the last swan song of that language. Uh, Jim, breadth of interest and erudition certainly saved him from that um, shallowness. And I think more now than ever, at the time when things are beginning to sort of polarize again into, you know, <coughs> high tech has almost become the official style now and so on. We're going to miss him like hell. Thank you. by asking people in the room to uh, intervene because uh, then perhaps uh, this um, sequence will be sort of stimulated to respond or, or to uh, react more diagonally, so to speak. And one of the problems, I think, is physical settings. And I know that this room, which I've been in before, of course, has this awkward sort of L shape. and not quite enough space here in order to uh, to uh, really set up a seminar, I think, which is uh, one of the problems. And uh, we tend, each of us, to uh, give our own view of things. And, and the difficulty is to uh, develop some kind of response. So maybe, uh, are, is there anyone in the audience who would like to respond to what they've heard this morning? And, uh, initiate some kind of discussion.
that we all as architects face. And I think the sort of conversation that I heard last night and I've heard a bit of this morning, attending to ignore what he was about in terms of actually what you're saying. Jim wasn't a talker, he wasn't a theorizer. I could probably agree with that. I didn't see why any constructor should theorize about what he constructs rather than do it. But there is this problem, I think, that you, you may not be able to get away from, uh, possibly my generation, the first, younger, who saw Jim in a different context, i.e. as an established architect, as a, someone one did look up to, one did take note of. Um, possibly your generation is having that difficulty in terms of a history now, which is what you're trying to initiate and establish, will misunderstand that I don't think Jim Sterling saw himself personally as something special. And I noted Creer saying last night that Jim had a sense of his own importance. Well, I really don't believe that. I think that he was far above thinking that as a human being, not as an architect, he was only interested in doing obviously suffer from frustration and therefore was forced into an introspection about his own position or his own work or whatever. I wonder how you feel about you as a group, a special group in terms of British architecture, looking as it were at yourself and wondering about how you could be less passionate or let's say more dispassionate about your lost friend. Well, uh, I don't know whether you'd like to respond. I mean, I'm quite willing to respond. But, um, I mean, I think that it, it varies, of course, from, from I, I think that different people have different kinds of relations to Jim. And, uh, and I, I had a relationship which was probably uh, more in the nature of a friendship, and but in terms of architecture, maybe had a certain distance to it. I think so. I think I would agree that uh, um, this question of what any figure's idea of him or herself is 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 a, is a kind of difficult thing to talk about because of this notion that someone has a sense of their own importance. I think that. Most human beings, you know, struggle to try to make sense of their lives, and that is a sobering <laughs> daily task, and uh, isn't very conducive to delusions about one's own importance. Ultimately, even if one gives that impression sometimes publicly, I think. So I don't think I think he he was very uh, down to earth, and as you 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 suggest, and also I think his life was a, a struggle, as most people's lives are struggles, perhaps more than most people's lives are struggles, because of the intensity of the ambition. But I mean, this is just my response to your intervention. I mean, uh, I think that uh, Sandy had a much closer involvement with him, I mean, in terms of uh, daily life than I ever had, really, particularly at a certain period. So maybe Sandy should say something also. Um, Julian, I think. Um, right from the first, when one met Jim, um, one was aware of, of a quite exceptional talent. And I was likening it last night to the way W. H. Jordan's friends just straight away knew, knew he, he got it and was something different. And certainly, it, it was as if I think Jim was was um, kind of taken over by a, a talent. Um, Corbu said that you know genius is fatal, but it's, and it can do you a lot of damage if you're on the receiving end of it. Um, almost straight away, um, Jim showed me his work, I mean, even his student work and so on. I mean, there was no doubt 
at all, that um, he wanted to make quite clear, you know, where he stood, what, what he stood for, what, what he'd done. And, and I was always aware of, of that right from the beginning and had a slight feeling that, that one had always to sort of help if one could, that, that he would get a chance to, to do what was in him. I have not had that impression from anybody else. And so my answer to you is we're talking, as far as I'm concerned, we're talking about somebody who was quite unique, who I think we treated as quite unique. I think we were very lucky. Um, may you find someone in your generation that you feel about like that too, and good luck to you.
emphasize its kind of thingness because of its, its embodiment of contradiction. And <clears throat> um, I, I can't think of a particular example, but that, that, that's what well, I can actually, that's sort of thing that goes through right way through the, the Japanese projects that, that I particularly worked on. This is where Jim would actually push and push and push to, to uh, once you thought you'd got something sussed, he would say, no, 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 it's not like that. It's, and he'd put a thumb on the thing. But this is what happens here. And um, then you'd have to um, draw your way out of uh, a situation into, into something which was kind of a, a, approach that kind of contradictory character where what, all things happen in the same place. I don't know whether that makes any sense, but it's, it seems to me to make sense. The architecture of the contradictions, it seems to me, between the different statements that we presented here today were all brought together in the work. You know, this incredible, the ev ev evocative power of the, of the places that uh, Richard Plasma talks about, which seems to me the most acute in the galleries in Stuttgart, where there is kind of aqueous quality to light, which makes you feel like you're in a Max Ernst. Uh, collage, like from the cement on table, where everything feels like it's underwater. <coughs> but that wateriness and that um, kind of the, the places which in Max Ernst's collages are the settings of, of death and, and hysteria and drowning and all sorts of so on are also places of great joy. So you've got, got, the, got death on the one hand and life on the other, all kind of balanced and brought together in those places through both tectonic and atectonic means simultaneously. And that seems to me to be, that's, is the, for me, the profound value of that middle period of work, where, uh, unlike the beginning and unlike the end, where, where, where there's a more kind of explicit <coughs> privilege of one over the other. And I think in that context, WZB in Berlin is actually, uh, becomes an incredibly interesting project because of the way in which it will I, I mean, speaking for myself, I think that's a, a real uh, amazing contribution because I think it points towards, you know, this business of tradition and, you know, uh, actually in a way overcomes what I think in a way is, is, is some way sort of false opposition between theory and practice you know, because uh, I think the way you discuss working in the office and, and the way you uh, widen it out to a larger uh, metrics. Uh, you know, is is uh, um, is extremely important because uh, it poses the question of what is the tradition, I think, to some extent, and whether, uh, particularly the way you end your statement, you know, for me, when you say, you know, as opposed to the beginning, as opposed to the end, this middle period has its importance because of the intensity of a, of a kind of almost mannerist, uh, unresolved. Uh, mutual revelation of the parts, you know, a referential to different values <coughs> from different aspects. And, uh, of course, it's not the first time that one could identify mannerism in, uh, in Occidental culture, for example, or maybe really other cultures. But, of course, it raises the issue, though, you know, in terms of continuing the tradition or continuing a tradition as to, as to how does one address then this legacy from a very recent time? You know? uh, where does one position oneself in relation to this legacy from a very recent, recent time? I mean, I think this question of like tectonic, atectonic, always you know, involves a very sort of nuanced reading of to what degree is it such? You know? uh, I mean, uh, for instance, the cladding of the concrete in uh, Stuttgart, which even with the client was obviously a critical question, you know, when faced with the concrete as cast. And I think remains a critical question, actually, in terms of to what degree does its own inherent contradiction of making make itself visible in the building or not, you know, in terms of, you know, the character of stone, the history of stone, the history of this particular building. You know, I think that the problem with, you know, the image culture is that, of course, <coughs> it flattens all this out. And, and, uh, and the danger of it is that it flattens it out. And then, in a certain sense, you can say the tradition is, is lost in that, in that flattening process. But maybe that's a question. Yeah. Um, 
maybe someone else wants to respond to that. No more interventions. Danny. Saying that, that, you're, that you're still ambivalent about the, the stone cladding? The no, I think that uh, cladding in stone is not uh, anything new, and there is uh, the idea that a building should have a cladding is, is after all, many, this is necessary even. You know. But how exactly do you do this cladding? You know? How exactly do you treat the stone that is a cladding you know, in this moment? of time, you know, faced with uh, conflicting aspirations and and uh, and also in that role in the role person which doesn't exist in the obviously stern was completely at ease with the most generalized program that was before him. Yes, but the kind of issues that David was raising, though, always involves this tension between whether you do it this way or you do it that way. And, and each of these moves have different implications with regard to all the, tra to the tradition. And this is the, uh, I think, is the, is the issue all the time, you know, in a way. I don't know. But, but then you, you said in your, in your piece that, that, that you saw in Sterling, <laughs> work and shift to a European theatre. Yeah? So the yeah. tradition therefore opens out in the way it's referred to by other people in terms of those people who Sterling referred to as being influenced so that in fact the tradition becomes much more uh, extensive than it had been for uh, most previous generations. As, as an One thing, I mean, I think David's uh, what David said was very, very interesting, and it relates to the idea of play, which uh, Sandy Wilson referred to, um, which is that I think with Sterling, the one had in Britain, one had somebody who carried on the uh, carried on the idea of architectural composition in a way that no one else um, came close to. Um, and that, that, that that idea of architectural composition, uh, composition, I mean, if one takes Corbes' uh, reply to Carol Teger in oh. 1928 oh. or thereabouts, and, and where Carol Teger is talking about Nostakika, oh. and Corbes says, forget it, oh. architecture is about composition. And that's what Jim did. They're, they're fantastic, wonderful compositions. And I'm also reminded of when Adrian Stokes talks about how the wall reappeared in Renaissance architecture after the long desert of, of Gothic, you know? There was the wall with, with which you could compose. And with that, you get the whole world of Hawkesmoor, of the, uh, what's called the terribilita, of the, the blankness. And I think it's that that so, was so wonderful about, about Jim, that it was just fantastic composition. It was playful, but it was mean, but it was also you know, it was a it was serious in a, in a way that I think all the the kind of frim frammery of uh, postmodernism just doesn't uh, just doesn't understand. I think again because as Sandy pointed out, Jim was so erudite. You know, he wasn't it wasn't as if he knew he he looked into the box. Yes, it wasn't as if the lid had come off the box recently. And I think in a way that's what Leon Creer and that group of people who began to uh, sort of allow Jim to um, unfold. 
Yeah, I think that's right. But I, you know, but I think in, in the even in that presentation, though, I feel that one of the, I mean, the, the uh, Julia was talking about distance, you know, and this question of of distance in relation to tradition seems to me to be where you could sort of focus the discussion because if you say composition, right, it, it gives such a stress to composition. But if you look at Churchill, Churchill is a stone-faced building. The way in which that stone is used is a little like the way stone was used in Le Corbusier's projects for stone-faced buildings. The way the stone is used on Le Corbusier's projects, like Central Soyuz, for example, is not the way the stone is used in Stuttgart. And then the question arises, how should we use the stone then, vis-a-vis -vis modern technology, vis-a-vis -vis the modern world? You know, and, and the tension, I think, uh, arises between uh, uh, using it uh, in one way or, or, or in another, uh, different ways. I mean, the tension arises between the composition, between a formal question, and the way things are made, which then has to do with the body and the kind of sensuousness, either through metaphor of looking at the thing, or through understanding that this is a revetment, you know, and it's, you know, this, which is a, also opens to a Stokes reading of the world as well. Because Stokes isn't only about comp composition either. And, and uh, so I think that this is where the, the kind of issues that David raises from working in, an off, in, in that office, you know, I think is, is unbelievably illuminating because it expands the question of how should the stone be there, you know. <laughs> I, I don't think that question is, is a question that, okay. which there's an easy answer, you know. I, uh, uh, I, I just, I mean, you did use the word composition, and you have to use that word. Um, but also, my favorite current painter, Kisai, also used the word composition, uh, with a game the same kind of richness of erudition and so on. When everybody else is painting targets and straps, someone talks about composition and you have incredible metaphors involved. What, what I think uh, is amazing is really where Jim lighted on this idea of the museum. Because actually, as a program, it, it enabled him to deploy that richness and depth, which you couldn't do in a school or housing or something. And which um, brought together with a kind of urban context, I, I believe that sort of Stuttgart is the one thing in which, because it's a museum, <coughs> its essence is about the visible and about movement. And Jim always talked about circulation and generating sort of structure. And somehow or another, all those things came together with an absolutely respectable intellectual uh, provenance to, and he did a building there which was unlike anything that Corbu or any of the old masters had done. And I think that building is a, the one really major intervention by, let us say, a post-Corbu post alto generation, which stands in contrast with that on equal terms. It's the only one. And it's something to do with what he's made of, which allowed him to produce this array. And I think that's historically, Ken, will you agree with me? Yes, maybe, yes. <laughs> I, mean, I can't, I'm trying to think of another one. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe things recent, very recent, but uh, there are some... You see, because in a way I, in a way I wonder whether you wrote in a, in a, a piece recently, or maybe not so recently, about there being possibly two descriptions of architecture, one so-called high-tech and the other to do with the compensatory facade. Oh. And I'm wondering if, in fact, your ambivalence about the stone static to Stuttgart isn't to do with a, a kind of morality rather than um, an acceptance that, mm -hmm. um, that buildings have this layering to them that have this, um, and what we have a fundamental ambivalence to them. 
Well, I, I think you know the, the fact that uh, uh, things have insides and outsides, things have different conditions, and they have to be uh, treated differently because of that. You know, weathering, not weathering, and so on. Uh, this builds into building anyway the, the contradiction that you're alluding to, I think. So that is inescapable, I think, in any case. The question of this moral issue, which of course also easily translates into moralistic, I know that, is more difficult, I think, since this question of the relationship between imagination and reality that Yanni uh, Pazma uh, uh, spoke about is, I think, a real issue for human beings. In every conceivable respect, this relationship between what is imaginary and what is real is a constant uh, uh, a struggle for them. And in this time, even more of a struggle when uh, so many references are completely dissolved by uh, high-speed technology and uh, by cybernetic and information uh, uh, proliferation. You know. So then this question, I think, of what, what is the nature of things comes back in a way, you know, to sort of, it's, it's there, I think, uh, trying to pretend it isn't there as a question. is not very productive. I mean, I think that it's more uh, um, fertile with regard to the tradition to enter into the question in a way. But I mean, that's all. Uh, some more? Uh, Yeah. I mean, just, yeah. by, just yeah. by way of good stop, I mean, I'll, I'll stop. No, 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 but it's I'll nice. This is a discussion after all. <laughs> this is the point. If you, if, you uh. take the stone, if you take the stone plan to suit God, yes, you take what Rickford talks about, the whole notion of architectural language being sedimentary, you, then you look up to the corners of the, of the building, and you realize that the corners is a sea wall. The, the cornice, in fact, is maybe the front from Lyme Regis or wherever. It seems to me that that is a, a, re a reading to the to the building, which is not um, you know which is not fanciful, but in fact it is to do with a, an idea about about building, which is not which I think I'm not saying that that, the, that, that your ambivalence, as I understand it, is um, illegitimate, but that it seems to me that. That in terms of um, the you know the, 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 the kind of resonance that in fact I think Sterling was was playing with um, I think I mean he was you know, playing playing with the, with the, the idea of what things were. Yeah, I think it's right. Yes. I don't I don't deny that. But I'm just saying that in terms of you know I mean uh, I think in. And my, my feeling is that in, in respect to his achievement, one should always push on everything, including his achievement, in terms of what is it, you know, and where should one take it now, you know. I, I, I mean, in the sense that the tradition, I feel that, that, that the tradition is important to, to work with the tradition by asking what questions about what is it exactly, you know. I mean, I, I, I was particularly struck, for example, by this arch, which I'd never, not fully digested before. This arch that uses banded stone, which is so evidently then applique, because the arch in its kind of keystone formation is denied by the banding of the stone. You know. And within that frame, the trick is turned, you know, and the fact that it is clad and the impossibility of the historic language at the same time as the historic language is evoked. I mean, I think that that arch says all those things. But then, uh, uh, given that that's a point reached, you know, in a game, then how does one react to this game if faced with the same point is the only thing I'm trying to say, you know. That maybe then there are, there are other issues to be fed into that. Like, for example, there are other ways to clad stone from the very beginning, which would also speak about revetment, without bonding the stone. Because to bond the stone, of course, is to speak not about revetment, but to say, well, it is, after all, stone. You know? I mean, these kinds of questions, which are, which are sort of, you could say, uh, maybe imponderable. But I think this is what being an architect is about, really. Yeah. And I agree, there is this kind of this um, extension. And it's dealing with, for as much as I understand that, it has to deal with both the materiality of the object as 
well as the fact that objects are architectural objects, so therefore they can have a region which is related to culture. And the, in fact, in the presence of an object, which is an architectural object, you are dealing both with the sort of the cultural tradition of uh, the region of buildings, as well as the material tradition. And this ambivalence works on both those levels in the way you're talking about. No, I, I think that's right. But you know, there's always, there's always this question of what is the cultural referent, though, that is first chosen? Like, you know, then the split between, you know, a, a classical tradition in Western culture and a non-classical tradition in Western culture arises. You know, which is the, which is the dominant key, so to speak? You know, I think comes back in a way somehow. You know, I mean, what, once it's decided, of course, it's decided. But which is. In a way, I suppose high tech tries to avoid that question. Are you, are you discounting the possibility that Jim was not an intuitive person by confusing his motives by the description of tradition, confusing it with possibly a I think you, you know, I don't know, from speaking for myself, I think you raise many issues, you know, this whole question of talent and intuition. I mean, I don't see how you can deny the importance of talent and intuition, but in a way, of course, there's not too much to be said about it. You either, you know, it, it, it is a kind of uh, um, 
it's a part of the person's character or their unconscious capacity, I think, their erotic and ludic capacity to make certain things rather than other things, I think that's, that's probably almost certainly so, you know. But I, I think, you know, at the same time as one said that, when, when Sandy was talking with his reference to Eliot about erudition and imagination, I, I think that that is also part of uh, the way people are and also the way people make things. And, um, you know, I was thinking about this business of the, of the plan of Stuttgart and this relationship to, as you were talking, you know, this relationship to the, to the Autobahn. I mean, I think that is a very, very uh, amazing kind of comment, also a critical comment in a way but also realistic in accepting it, the, 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 the fact that that's not really a boulevard in the 19th century sense at all. But I was also thinking about this business of the way through, which is also present in Dusseldorf, which, is the, which I think has the intentional meaning that people could become aware of a museum, I mean, as something, as part of their daily life, without ever going into it, you know. And that this was also sort of a kind of... Uh, I don't know, uh, if you like, even you could say cultural political response to the issue of museum and late 20th century society. I mean, as, as a kind of maybe conscious intention. I mean, I never heard Jim say this, but it seems to me not unreasonable knowing other things that he said, that that wasn't a conscious intention, also. as well as being maybe a, a, a kind of peculiar labyrinthic impulse that can't really be made uh, uh, you know, rational, neither to the subject, either. But isn't, sorry, I, 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 isn't that actually essential humanity? Isn't it that, 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 this, that, that quality is not marginalized, but for those people that who aren't within the architectural profession, but who experience that architecture, doesn't that provide that vital interface where people can suddenly say, well, this is architecture. Those people that don't normally recognize it. Isn't it that very engagement that singles in and work out? Yeah. Shouldn't yeah. we be seeing that as an important no, I, Yeah, I think so, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I think this business of, that, that really a work should be able to exist at, at, at a number of different levels uh, and should be accessible at different levels is, is really something that architecture should be about, as opposed perhaps to other arts. Yeah. So, any more? You don't want to say anything, Alan? Thank you. I am, I am struck by the, you know, there are so many unanswered questions that seem to me to give us food for thought well into the future. I, the, the, the issue with Stuttgart and the stone, I mean, there is that wonderful little commentary off to the side somewhere, the stone falls away and is left alive from the garage. Was that an issue in the office that you, that you agonized over? Michael, did you, did you, um, I mean, it's, 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 it, by one direction, you, you, you're, it's your first to, sort, of, sort of meeting with the building, is this small piece of crumbling. That's a joke. It is play. It's a joke. It's a play. It is play. Which we will continue to unravel and agonize over well into the future. Let me thank everyone for this extraordinary morning. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.